Shop Talk 223. I'm Mike Pekovich, filling in for Ben Strano, who's taking a very rare yet very well-deserved day off. And not only am I not Ben, I'm also on the road at Connecticut Valley School of Woodworking, where I'm talking to one of our favorite podcasters, Bob Van Dyke, who always has something to say about just about everything, and a brand new guest, master upholsterer and finisher, Mike Michelli. Wait until you hear what Mike has to say about finishing. We're going to get into chop temperatures and finishing, bad shellac, router bases, and Mike will even give probably one of the best brief histories on finishing that I've ever heard. Also, don't forget to check out our latest shop class webinar. This is good. With Brian Boggs, master chair maker and genius of the jig, where he talks about the evolution of his legendary ladderback chair and how it influenced his latest creation. To listen to the webinar, uh, sign up for it at finewoodworking.com slash shop class. All right, we're going to have some fun. Frankly, we get off the rails a little bit, but I don't know if that's a bad thing. We'll get going right after a brief word. Have you heard about Festool USA's new cordless tool lineup? Festool packed top shelf performance and value in these new tools. The TID-18 Impact Driver and T-18 Easy Drill Driver both start at just $199. Want to mix and match tools on the Festool battery platform? Purchase Festool's new cordless products as combo sets paired with one of Festool's premium cordless saws. Festool tools are always packaged in the company's sustainer organization and storage system. And Festool stands behind their German-engineered products with a three-year all-inclusive wear and tear warranty that covers the tool, battery, and charger. For more information, visit festoolusa.com slash cordless. Hey, Shop Talk Live listeners. Take a deeper dive into woodworking topics you love when you join the Fine Woodworking Unlimited community. From in-depth video workshops, projects and plans, tips and techniques, you'll find everything you need to know to master your craft. Try Unlimited now and enjoy a 14-day free trial. Find out more at finewoodworking.com slash members. All right, welcome to Shop Talk Live. I'm Mike Pekovich filling in for Ben Strano. And I have a couple friends with me today who both happen to be master craftsmen in their own right. I have uh, Mike Michelli, um, incredible traditional upholsterer. You've been going about this for about 40 years or so and uh, teaching as well. Um, this is super cool. And Bob Van Dyke, um, a great woodworker, specializing in the shaded fan oval <laughs> in the, uh, and runs a school at Connecticut Valley School of Woodworking. So really cool to have both of you guys together. Um, how long have you guys known each other? How'd you guys get together? Wow. Saratoga. It was the Saratoga show. Um, Northeast Woodworkers. Huh? Yeah. Northeast, North, Northeast Woodworkers Association. Um, Oh, 10 years ago? Oh, at least. Yeah, I yep. know. It was because I remember Mickey Callahan and Jim Altimus. Yeah, that's it, the Saffron guys. You, me, and one or two other people who I don't remember uh, going to this uh, this uh, Italian restaurant right on Main Street in, uh, <laughs> and you were you were in your heaven, well, you know, you, you know. were in your place. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's where I remember meeting you from from that, and it's, it's all gone downhill yeah, since then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Mike, uh, you've been in upholstery for a long time. You do traditional furniture, but you also do awesome car upholstery too. I never really connected those two. Well, it's it's interesting. I started in the antique car business, um, and I did a lot with it. A lot of British cars over the years. Uh, it's very profitable. It's very challenging, and I'm doing less and less. Um, by choice in my older age because it's physically very demanding. Uh -huh. uh, it's really hard on your getting the hands and knees all the time and in and out of the cars. And in uh, about, I don't know, 20 years ago, I met Don Williams, uh, now retired from the Smithsonian, and that kind of turned my my interest more toward furniture stuff. And I you know worked with Don on many, many projects, including, including the current one. And I've gotten more interested in furniture. I, I get met Bob through uh, Period Furniture Makers, um, and now I'm working with a wonderful traditional French craftsman called Bruno Lopez, who's taught me more in, in the last couple of years than I learned in a lifetime. Um, and there's a, there's a niche for 
traditional work in upholstery, um, hopefully still, where people will still appreciate the, the hand-sewn work. Um, and the car stuff, um, it's not something I'm really pursuing at, as much as I used to, uh, even though I would, if an interesting job came along, I'd probably do it, but not as much as I used to. Cool, cool. And you got involved in finishing as well. Well, that was because of Don. Um, okay. You know, I got involved with Don and a fellow called Mitch Kohanek, who was mm -hmm. a very well-known teacher uh, and ran a program out in uh, Minnesota for many years, teaching wood finishing as a nine-month program. Think about that, Bob. Yeah. You know, nine months of wood finishing. And, and through that— And even then, you just, you just kind of hit the <laughs> yeah, surface. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. So um, we started an organization called Professional Refinishers about 20 years ago, which I continue to run, uh, which is a network of folks involved in the furniture restoration and conservation world. And they taught me really all about finishing. And then because of Bob, um, I got I got stuck. And he said, you know anybody that can teach a finishing class? And I said, well, if you're desperate, I'll fill in. So I did, and it worked. And now I've been teaching finishing for quite a while now. And cool. we'll hear again this fall for Bob. Cool. Um, because there still seems to be a, a tremendous amount of interest in the mysteries of finishing, even though uh, when you really take it apart, it's not – all that complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, we have a bunch of questions lined up for you guys, but I'm going to sneak in a question of my own out of, <laughs> of pure selfishness. It's good to be the king, Mike. Yeah. Because um, one of the reasons you're down here, um, I was teaching this weekend and Bob showed me uh, a top for a cabinet that you're making. Yeah. And it's to the point now where the finish is built up. It's got that kind of glossy sheen. And always you have to do something to that finish in order to finish it. I've always gone with, you know, four-out steel woolen wax. That's been my go-to. But Bob was pulling out a bunch of different kinds of abrasives and said that you had a really cool technique for going about it, which was way different than what I've done, but I'm super curious to see how it turns out. Well, I guess you could sum it up by this. You, if you're going to have a film finish as opposed to an oil finish, if you're going to build up something that creates a, a, a film on the surface and that film becomes hard enough, you can... I'll, I'll say progressively abrade it. So you can scratch it at 220 and then you can continue to scratch it finer and finer and finer. And if you scratch it uh, and polish and scratch and polish fine enough, you can build up uh, a depth of gloss depending on how much film you have there to work with and right. how hard the film is. So what Bob's done is build up a bunch of varnish, um, oil varnish, and it's hardened now for a while. And we're going to progressively abrade it up to about... I don't know, 2,500 grit, um, and then sort of gently um, try to bring the sheen even. What your steel wool does basically is to kind of round over the, the, the imperfections, whereas what we're going to do is actually cut. You're going you're gonna to use uh, an abrasive to actually remove some of the finish, where the steel wool doesn't really remove very much. Okay, it right. just sort of softens everything, and the wax fills in some of the – the imperfections, and it gives you a nicer, evener sheen. But you don't really remove any finish. Okay. We're going to remove, if there are, um, if you can picture a piece of um, plastic, um, like a drop cloth, you know, there's only maybe two or three mils of finish on Bob's piece. Okay. And we're going to remove probably half of that. Wow. So we'll remove some. Hopefully there's enough left to create an even surface. And then we're going to try to get that as even as possible with just uh, very precise sanding and bringing it up through the grits uh, to a place where he's happy, where it's an, uh, not so glossy and not so soft. And then we can adjust. It's fa to me, it's uh, the process has always fascinated me that you're mechanically – manipulating the sheen going from kind of kind of rough looking really plasticky really weird looking like you why would you want to do this right. to leveling it dead level with by sanding you know 320 400 grit bringing it all down and then going okay now let's go and go up to a you know like traditionally rotten stone pumice that sort of thing and bringing it up to a, you know, you can, you know, a, a uh, completely transparent, you can see through it. Right. I did a piece years ago, a box that just to see how far I could push it. 
and it was on my bench and over over my bench there used to be a light that had a a, a steel grid right and it was like okay I, ha- I have a picture somewhere you can see the steel grid perfectly reflected <laughs> in this box top and there's no distortion wow. at all wow. it, well i have a little so demo cool. that i do with students which i'll do here in in uh, the class That's with, so with cool. bob yeah we take a piece of ordinary hardware store plexiglass okay and yeah. scratch it at 220 oh cool and look at what those scratches look like yeah and yeah. when you do that it's basically you, you can't see anything through it okay and then through a series of steps i'll bring that back up to dead clear um, by polishing, and that really that technology comes from the automotive industry that I grew up in, where your um, years ago we painted in straight lacquer, and you would simply have paint surface to to bring up. Now we paint base coat and a clear coat, but you're going to bring that sheen up really to get the kind of gloss that Bob's talking about, where it's really really water clear. You've got to be up in the 2,000 grit range. Uh, either with uh, abrasive or with a compound. And the, the liquid compounds are different because the abrasive breaks. Uh, it fractures on purpose. So you're going to let the abrasive sacrifice itself to get up to those gloss levels uh, where you're going to be, you know, at 2,000, 3,000 like grit. A, like a Japanese water stone. Yeah, yeah. Stone. It's a, yeah. The, the abrasive fractures on yeah. purpose, and um, that's how you get those big numbers. He used to do the same thing, though, with... Um with uh, glass blowing when I was blowing glass because the the punty and all, you'd grind the punty um, and the bottom and all, and it would be, you know, obviously very coarse. Right. But then you could bring it up progressively to um, the final one was cerium, yep. which got you to the completely optical um, you know, what scratches you can't, right. you yeah. can't see. Telescope quality. Right. Cerium oxide. Yeah, yep. yeah. Okay. and it was just that's a, this, it was the same thing. Okay, really fascinating. Wow. So yeah. the tabletop you guys are starting with this was probably like the big question is before you get to the stage where you're ready to rub out. How did you go from bare wood to get to the finish you've got right now? This one was different from you know like the it's a water locks uh, which was a which you know oil varnish finish um, and rather than w- rubbing it on, you know, wiping it on, sanding it on, and then wiping back and all this stuff, right. um, it was like if you read the instructions, <laughs> uh, and, and it says basically you are putting it on like a traditional varnish. Okay. Brushing it on, scuff sanding, brushing it on, scuff sanding. But your your base uh, wood was sanded at what grit when you started finishing? Uh, well, it was hand planed and then um, and then th- and then just three twenty, and the three twenty just amalgamates any you know any mm-hmm. fine you you see any tear out or anything like that. Right. But you know yeah, so there was no color process on this one. And, you know, it was just the about five, I think it was four or five coats okay. of the Waterlocks varnish um, brushed on with foam brushes. Okay. Were you knocking down dust nibs or anything between uh, coats? In, bet- uh, in between, yeah, I scuffed, sanded with 320 after the first two coats. I scuffed, scuffed okay. it and knocked that down. Yeah. Okay. And Mike was saying you guys are going to go up to a pretty good sheen, but you were showing me a lot of um, like sanding pad product, like yeah. the Aberlon. It looks like Scotch Bright pads. Basically. This is this is Merlon, which is uh, similar to the Scotch Bright, but I think it goes finer. Okay. You know, much much finer, yep. and it's really a nice uh, a nice product. Just using that wrapped around a felt a felt block. Okay. Um, and it really was, I mean, the, I had used, you know, the, the Merlon and I had used, uh, pumice and rotten stone and that sort of thing in the past, dry or wet. And, uh, Mike, uh, you know, a couple months ago was helping me do a, a similar one. And 
it was like, let's do this whole thing dry and wrapping the Merlon around the felt block and really controlled. And it really opened my eyes because it was, it was actually simpler process than what I've done in the past with the, you know, the traditional pumice, rotten stone, the yeah. paraffin oil and all that stuff. It's messy. Yeah. And you can, the nice thing is you can see what you're doing. When you put the liquids into that, yes, you don't it's know. kind of like, yeah, I wonder what's happening here. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, yeah. too far. Well, the other thing I'll just mention quickly is this is a, a tabletop or a, a chest of drawers chest top. Of drawers. Yeah. And the f- step one in the process is to use some blue tape on the edges. Yeah, really important. So that was a different thing that Bob hadn't done before. And when I first started a million years ago in the car business, we painted in lacquer. And when you learn how to rub out a car... You, you taped off all the sharp edges of the fenders okay. so the big buffer didn't buff through. Okay. Because the paint doesn't stick, you know, the, or the varnish doesn't stick on the edges very well. So we protected, you know, the first, say, quarter of an inch all the way around with blue tape. So not just the, the sides, the edges, you're actually talking the border, Correct. skinny yeah. border along the top. Correct. Okay. So that protects that top edge yeah. until the very end. And we get up into the really, really high grits, then you pull the tape. Okay. Yeah. So you don't want to be cutting through your... Um, cutting through your edge because you wind up with a with a no, with no finish on the uh, on the corners. Okay, that was a really cool. Just technique. a little technique yeah. that you that know only really, takes a minute to do, but yeah. it makes a big difference uh, in the end. Cool. Yeah. So, like on a scale of one to ten, if one is dead flat and ten is like just high high gloss, what gloss level are you shooting for? It's really up to the to the eye of the beholder. I mean, in the in the finishing world, it's it's the opposite. Um, dead flat is measured, say, at 10 sheen. Okay. And a perfect finish would be 100 sheen, even though there's no 100. Okay. So um, a, a true gloss finish would be like an 85, 90 sheen. Okay. And a semi-gloss or satiny would be in the 40s or 50s. Okay. So sometimes you would get a, a like a commercial cabinet shop would get a specification that says, I want three and a half mils of pre-catalyzed lacquer, and I want it rubbed at an 80 sheen. Wow. Okay. So that's a technical spec that, can be actually measured with a, with a meter. You okay. can really determine that. If you need to match something that's pre-existing, say from a year ago, that's at a certain sheen, you need to know what you're trying to match to get it to be, if they're side by side, so it looks right. But in this case, it'll be whatever Bob thinks. And I think we'll be in the probably 70, 80 sheen range. We, and judging because of the piece that it's going with, uh, which is a little bit flatter, uh, Sheen, I think I wouldn't be surprised if we go up a little bit too high, okay. and then we have to and then we have to knock it back a little okay. bit. Okay, and you just control the sheen with the where you stop the, the abrasive where yeah. you stop. Yeah. yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. All right, and it's it's what's it, Bob? Um, Bob uh, Flexner. Flexner. Years ago, um, he he did a finishing class here years ago, and he had the coolest. Um, demonstration because it was a it was a piece of wood or a piece of plywood and the first eight inches of it it was varnish and it looked like and it might have very well done this you know finished the whole thing and on one side of it it looked like the ocean if you look at the ocean and it's all you know like that and that's what it looked like okay and then he went from there to rubbed out perfect like the piano finish. Right. It was so cool. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Well, that ans- kind of answers my question. I'm going to stick around and see what you guys do with the tabletop. <laughs> that, that would be a good article. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's ask some uh, reader questions since they're the ones who are keeping the lights on for us. Um, first one is from Bob. Let me get this here. Hi, guys. I'm finishing up a new small shop in my backyard. I've put in dual pane windows, and I'm finishing up insulating the walls and the ceiling. I intend to install a vented gas wall heater to warm it up in the winter. That's great. I plan to heat it up about 50 degrees. Um, What I'm wondering is whether that is warm enough to put on finish. Most of my finishes will be shellac or varnish, while... um, Painting shop furniture. Do I need to turn up the heat when finishing? Um, this is from Bob. Not well, Bob, Bob. Not, um, me. <laughs> it's a, not the other Bob. This is a great question. Interesting. This is exactly my own shop. Okay. Because um, you're in upstate New York. Yeah. Okay. And my answer uh, is yes and no. 
So th there's two parts of the answer. It really depends on what you're finishing with. So the shellac will have different requirements than the varnish. So we'll, we'll start with uh, the basics of that. For any finishing project, if you can get the finish itself a little bit above room temperature, it's going to help the whole process. So if it's shellac and your ambient temperature is 60, if you can get the shellac up to, say, 70 degrees, uh, that's better. So you would take the, if it's liquid shellac and you have it in a mason jar, you can put it in a, in a uh, the, mason, the whole mason jar in a, a pan of hot water okay. for a 15 minutes okay. and raise that temperature up a little bit. So the finish is warm and the piece needs to be warm. So if you take the piece from your warm house and bring it out to your cold shop, if the piece is warm and the finish is warm and it's shellac, you'll be fine. Wow, okay. The shellac will dry fine, even at 50 degrees, 60 degrees, and it doesn't need a lot of dry time. In 15 or 20 minutes, the alcohol's gone and you're, you're good. It's really the opposite with the varnish. As Bob, this Bob knows, varnish is very slow to dry. So if you warm up your varnish, that's really good. If you make sure your piece that you're putting it on is warm, the wood is warm, that's great. But you need to maintain some temperature for that varnish to cure, and it's going to be really, really slow at 50. And then what's going to happen is because the varnish dries so slowly, you're going to get a lot of dust and, and, and junk in your finish, and it's going to be frustrating. So yeah. I would say your, your varnish finishing is probably not going to be real successful in the winter, but your shellac or lacquer would be just fine. Okay, so what if I have a, a thermostat and I can come in, say, the day or the night before and kick that up? How warm, ideally, do I want to get my shop, realistically, in the wintertime, um, to be a little more successful with varnish? If I can get up to 60 degrees temporarily, is that going to help? Um, the manufacturer's recommendation for most of the oil varnishes would be 70 degrees. Okay. Uh, I have, I, I, in, in a real-life situation, you cheat. Um, 60 to 65 is the minimum. You've okay. got to get it above 60 or you're not going to be successful. It's just not going to dry. It's going to get gummy. Okay. So you, the more the better. I mean, varnish likes to be warm, um, but the shellac is very forgiving and lacquer even more so. I mean, I've sprayed lacquer on a loading dock at 10 degrees outside. Okay. So the, if the finish is warm, either it's a rattle can or it's liquid and the piece is warm, wow. you've got a great chance. Cool. That, I that, never even heard of that. That second thing, though, that you said is the piece is warm. Yep. And, you know, that's the thing that a lot of, you know, oh, I'll, I'll you know, I'll turn up the uh, heat and it's been, yes. it's been 30 degrees <laughs> and wood <laughs> takes a long time yeah. Yeah. to catch up to the, yeah. you know, the the temperature. You're describing my finishing routine in the winter time. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, bring the piece yeah. into the warm overnight yeah. and bring it out into the shop and warm up the finish and you've got to you'll improve your chances by 100%. Sure. Awesome. Sure. Awesome. Super cool. Um all right, so here is what do we have? Uh another finishing question. Um I recently finished a farmhouse table using reclaimed pine. Uh, I wanted to give the wood an old tone and decided on some amber shellac instead of figuring out conditioning and keeping stain from splotching. I now realize my canned shellac was probably <laughs> six to eight years old. Okay. Um, uh, the first meal eaten on the table has caused uh, warm or hot plates to melt uh, <laughs> the finish, causing marks and placemats to stick, uh, cold glasses to ring, and fingerprints and marks from general contact. Are you uh, concurring that maybe this was an issue of the shellac being too old? Yes. All right. So if I've got a can of shellac in my shop, um, how do I ensure that it's going to dry once I get it on the piece. Okay, a couple things. Um, if you're buying shellac from the home center, it's Zinsser. Uh, they make it in really still anymore about two flavors. There's a they call a clear and an amber. Okay. Uh, there is a date code on the can that you need to get the they actually on the Zinsser website or the RPM website, they'll give you a decoder so you know what the date code is. But the rule of thumb is about three years. Okay. That's liquid. 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 So the liquid shellac that you're buying in the yellow can from Home Depot, uh, it may have been on the shelf at Home Depot for two years before right. you bought it. Okay. So the rule is uh, about three years. And the, the simple test is this. You take some of the liquid shellac and you put it on a hard surface like the, the lid of the can, the metal lid or a piece of plexiglass or something. If you put a... a, a 
drop full of liquid shellac on a hard surface and you walk away from it and you come back in an hour, uh -huh. if you can make a fingerprint in it, throw it away. Okay. There's no bringing it back. If it's you're, done. The, the process, the chemical process is called esterification. Okay. And once that resin uh, decides to go the other way, there's no recovering. Okay. Uh, it's just a bad batch and it's, it, you, you can't save it. If it's not going to dry in an hour, uh, it's not going to dry. What's the shelf life on flakes? If flakes are kept in a dry uh, you know, place in the dark, uh, endless, basically unlimited, and forever. So as long as they're not all glommed up together? They call that blocking. Yeah. Uh, when yeah. the shellac flakes start to block together, uh, there's not much you can do. But if it's in a sealed container, uh, if you use, a, let's say, a mason jar, you can, you can uh, wrap the outside of the jar with brown paper so no light gets to it and put it on a dry place. Um, it'll last indefinitely. How, how important is the light to, to the process? You know, I don't think it's huge. It's, it's not as important as the air infiltration, yeah. the, oxi the, the yeah. oxygen, but it doesn't hurt. Okay. Uh, in any of these finishes, any UV that gets to it is no good. So just a piece of brown paper solves that problem if it's mm. in a glass. The only shellac flakes I've ever had that just failed to dissolve, like they just stayed in gummy flakes at the bottom, has been de-wax shellac. Is that a coincidence, or is there something that would cause the de-wax shellac to go bad? Was it a real early? light color, Mike? Yeah, super light. Yeah, the thing about the light colors is shellac in its native form wants to be dark, and to make it really blonde, they have to bleach it chemically. Okay. So that bleaching process uh, changes the chemical nature of the shellac, and it makes it last in at least in my opinion, not as long. Okay. So the the really, really blonde shellacs are more fragile. So that's as much about the color as it was just the de-waxed Yeah, more about it. the color. Okay. Wow, Does that change cool. the uh, hardness of it? Uh, there's a lot of school of thought on that. I mean, the, the natural wax content in shellac, depending on where it's harvested, what the bugs were eating when the shellac was put down, can vary. Um I don't think it's a, a real big difference. I mean, a lot of people now are really concerned about the wax and the shellac. And if you are, you buy the off-the-shelf product that Zinsser makes called Seal Coat, which is a two-pound de-waxed uh, lemon color shellac that's really a universal sealer, and it, it works beautifully. The average person, I don't think you're going to notice that much of a difference between that and the waxy shellac. Okay. If you take the regular wax shellac and let it sit long enough— uh, gravity will work. The the wax will settle out, and you can decant the de-wax shellac off the top of the can uh, easily, if that's a concern. Okay. And then you use the resulting wax for, for your shoes. For your shoes. For shoe polish. Yeah. No, well, shoe polish, Is, but it was also there's a name for these things. That's an aglet. What is it? Aglet. Aglet, that's, I've heard that. These used to be shellac. For those of you that can't see, Bob is holding up his shoelaces. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bob. Dipped in shellac. Uh-huh. Okay. Yep. Okay, so there's a second part to this question. Uh, uh -huh. I, I know that uh, the old shellac was a mistake, and maybe even shellac in general for a dining table. Can I salvage the finish with a coat or two of fresh shellac and make it harder and less susceptible to hot plates and cold glasses? Can I place a tougher, clear top coat that would adhere, adhere to the wax shellac, or I'm stuck removing it and starting the finish process all over? That's the real question. Well, I'm taking a deep breath here. Um, my my, when I first read this question last night, I'm thinking, well, to be really truly safe, I would take the finish off and start over. Um, chances are the gummy shellac that's on there is esterified, and it's really not ever going to resolve. Um, the way to test that would be this. If you can scuff it with 220 sandpaper and you get a, a nice, even white dust, okay. then the shellac is dry enough that you can put something on it. Okay. Shellac makes a wonderful universal sealer. So as a beginning coat, many, many finishers that I know in shops will start with a shellac under whatever they're doing, right. whether it's varnish or lacquer or anything else. So I would say 220 sandpaper on a, on a rubber block or a felt block if it powders up nicely and you can get an even uh, pattern to the sanding, you can recoat it. Okay. Um, I would put a little more shellac on, fill in the 220 scratches, um, and then the reality is shellac is just not going to work with the lasagna pan. It's just not. <laughs> shellac is a wonderful thing. 
Um, it has two major flaws. It's not particularly heat resistant or alcohol resistant. If you put a whiskey glass or a perfume bottle on a, a, a cured shellac surface, eventually the alcohol will attack the shellac and the heat is, it's just not okay for a dining table. You're not going to be happy. Okay. So you need something more robust, I think, for the for the dining table. And shellac's really not going to, as a as a sealer, it'll be okay, but as a top coat, probably not. All right. So how am I getting the sticky stuff off? Because I can I just just saturate it with alcohol and wipe it off, or am I really trying to strip it, strip it down? Well, uh, chemically, um, denatured alcohol will, and and as scuffing pad or a steel wool pad will probably take it off just fine. Okay. Uh, you don't need a commercial stripper. Okay. Uh, the alcohol, denatured alcohol from the hardware store would be just fine. But just remember that denatured alcohol, the denaturant is methanol, yep. which is toxic. So if you can do it outside, that's better. Uh, a dust mask is not sufficient protection where a respirator methanol is poison. So be careful with denatured alcohol uh, in stripping off that old finish. Okay. So maybe get a bottle of Everclear, drink a little, there you and go. finish a little. And <laughs> that's, <go>. that's, <laughs> then and you won't notice it if there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and then you get a very pleasant buzz from the fumes. Uh, but be careful with denatured alcohol just in general. Right on. And you don't, to do that, you don't have to get like 100% of the no. finish off. Okay, so I'm not off. having to abrade back to bare wood. Yeah, I mean, okay. you're... No, I wouldn't think so. I mean, what yeah. you want to be able to do is get a surface that you can scuff it at 220 and not have a gummy. If your sandpaper's all gummy, then you, you've got to get rid of that, what's making it gummy. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Jason, yeah. there you go. Um, Bob, here's a question directed more your way uh, from Chris. Hi, Shop Talk. I know that Mike and Bob are big fans of adding extended plexiglass bases on routers. Can you share more about why they're so helpful and how we might go about doing this at home? Uh, what's the thickness? Does it come from the home center? Uh, do we need to get pre-drilled universal bases from woodworking suppliers, which can be expensive? Yes, they can. Um, are the routers center on the extended base or favored to one side? And since... You do most of this, Bob, and I just try to steal your plates when I'm there. I'll let you <laughs> tackle this one. So, so yeah, my all of my fixed base routers have offset bases on them, um, and that basically, I started doing that oh, probably thirty years ago. Um, from basic laziness and I brought uh, the router the, or the original router with that still has the original offset base and you'll see that it has a hole in the end and I was doing an arc not a circle but just an arc with it um, and then I was going to put the original base back on, and I said, like, nah, it's fine. And then I started using it with that offset base, and I was like, whoa, this is much better because what it allows me to do, a fixed base base, a fixed base router, you're on an edge more often than not. You know, you're sure. doing some sort of profile or rabbit or something. And when you're on the edge, it can be a little tippy. So by having this offset thing here, my hand, one hand can be on that pushing down and the other hand is over here. So it gives me way, way more control than uh, than just the original uh, the original base. Cool. And for the folks who are driving right now listening to this, it's a regular DeWalt uh, fixed base router. Um, and this plate is basically the plate is in the shape of like a teardrop and is overall looks like about 12 inches long. Something so like you've that. you've got, you know, six to eight inches yeah. of base extending out one side of the base. And so that's what you can pressure and down. And it's a good quarter inch thick too, right, Bob? Uh, roughly, yeah, close to that, three sixteenths. Oh, cool. And the thing is, it needs to, you know, it's better if it's stiff, Okay, you know, if it's thin enough that it's going to flex, you know, and lots of times it's not an issue, but for certain things it might be, uh, you know. So for this thing here where, I mean, my hand is literally pushing down and it's, I just naturally go that way. Yeah. And I, 
did that with all of my fixed base routers and then started doing it with the laminate trimmers. And the laminate trimmers, um, the same, the same thing, uh, you know, and it's just a piece of uh, plexiglass, Lexan. Uh, it's pretty much whatever. I use scraps, whatever I can find. And, uh, you know, it machines really easily. People are all worried about machining this stuff. Yeah. And it cuts on the table saw, band saw, drill it, route it, not an issue at all. Okay. Um, and what I do is I buy the, you know, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm out of scraps and I'm a scrounge, I mean, I'll see something, a broken whatever. I was like, yeah, that'll be good. Um, but if I'm out, then my glass shop, you know, regular glass shop, uh, I, I'll go and say, you got any plastic scraps that you want to get rid of? And it's like, oh yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, one time I went over there and they didn't even charge me. And I had this huge handful, I mean, arms full of, uh, of all of this stuff. Cool. And it was all different thicknesses and it was fantastic. I also, I haven't used it yet. But I bought it last winter, and it's a um, it's a what is this stuff called? Um, it's a laminate, but that's not the word. Uh, here's the word. Um, it's a phenolic. That's the word I was looking okay. for. So it's a it's a phenolic plastic that I got from MSC. You can also MSC Direct is a fantastic uh, resource. You can also get it from McMaster Car, and it's unbelievably stiff. You know, so um, that's it looks on like the, both quarter inch and that's like three eighths of an inch. Uh, yeah, something like that. And that's on the list to um, to try. Okay. Uh, Will Neptune is the one that uh, he he turned me on to it, and he made a base from it, and it was you know really good. Now this stuff is it's opaque as opposed to being able to see through it. Well, that's the that's kind of in a way a downside. Yeah. Um, I you can know, see where certain instances you want to be able to see through the plate. Other times it might not be that. Yeah, big of a for deal. certain things it doesn't matter, but you know, so I mean that's frankly one of the reasons why. Uh, it's probably been sitting and hasn't made it to the very top of my list to get it done. Cool. Okay. Uh, so because I, of that? I'm at the home center. I'm buying some stuff. I've heard of Lexan. I've heard of Plexiglass. Are they interchangeable? Is it the same stuff? Or are no. they different things? Lexan is way more expensive. Okay. And it's way tougher. Okay. So the Plexiglass is, you know, the the... You know, that'll break and crack and all that other stuff. Uh, I was buying some some plastic a couple years ago. Steve uh, Lotta was doing a class, and we needed some, and he was referring to Lexan. So I was like, all right, I'll buy the Lexan. Turned out we could have had anything. Um, but so I'm looking it up online, and it was like, what's the difference? And there was motorcycle windshields that were made out of Plexi and Lexan and a couple other things. And it was, it was pretty dramatic because they had this motorcycle windshield and they took this big hammer. Oh, I and, thought you were going to say a bird. <laughs> no, it was a big <laughs> hammer. And have at it. And, you know, the Plexi just gone. Okay. And the Lexan, they were beating on it and, you know, it didn't hurt anything, huh. you know. What it, what's your, uh, you know, more about this stuff than I do, Mike? Well, the, the chemical composition is, is different. Lexan is a proprietary product. It's a GE product. So it's a, it's not a, it's a brand name. Mm -hmm. But the other generic stuff is referred to as polycarbonate. Yeah. Yeah. So if you see that in the, and the rack at Home Depot, um, most of what is on that rack is relatively inexpensive polycarbonate, which if you, in the thinner uh, thicknesses, if you bend it, it'll snap. The Lexan is a, is a very different animal. It's a different, different chemical composition. And as Bob says, 
if you're going to make these, uh, I think it's really worth the extra to get the Lexan. It's different from the, the it's, so it's that different from the polycarbonate? Polycarbonate is the generic term for all of the cheap plastic. And there's, it's kind of like spaghetti sauce. They're all a little bit different depending on who's making them. But Lexan is proprietary. It's made by GE. It's formulated the same every time. And it's, a, it's the gold standard. Uh, well, what's the difference between polycarbonate and plexiglass? Plexiglass is like Kleenex. It's a it's a generic term. It yeah. doesn't really tell you a lot. Okay. There's no chemical composition for plexiglass. It's a generic. So you could have polycarbonate in your hand, or you could have what you bought as Plexi, and it's really polycarbonate. They're all polycarbonate. That's their so that's, that's their it. They're all polycarbonate. And okay. so is Lexan, but it's got some other special sauce in there that makes it tougher. Anchovies. Yeah, it's probably. Yeah. And then the olive oil is in uh -huh. there. Got, okay. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So definitely uh, it's worth just picking some up and making your own as opposed to well, um, buying a universal I can base. tell you this. Every store that I know of, every restaurant that I know of has just recently invested in plexiglass. Uh, for, yeah. <laughs> so everywhere you go now, uh, I have a friend in the plastics industry, and he had a warehouse full of stuff that is completely sold out. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but lots of fabricators that do countertop work or other kind of installations might have, as Bob was saying, scrap because right now everybody wants okay. plexiglass. So it might be easier so to find. Free might be stuff a lot easier to, to find it. Okay. You can't. I mean, I couple you know two months ago, um, the Woodcraft store needed some um, screens for the you know for the uh, for the cash register. So I made them and buying this stuff online normally, yeah, yeah, no problem, piece of cake. And the amount of money that I spent and the amount of time that I spent online and out of stock, out of stock, out of stock, estimated delivery time, 10 weeks. And it's nuts. Tough. A friend of mine was even telling me that now because of that, laptops – are now being affected because of the uh, um, it's I guess it's part of the uh, screen, huh? Um, you know, so the the availability of those is like kind of or the price has gone I'm like okay. Wow, <laughs> yeah. cool. Hey, uh, before we move on, Jeff, do we need to stop and take a break? Uh, we can do that. Okay, we're gonna stop and take a break and uh, make room for commercials, right? Right now. Regardless of your skill level in woodworking or home repair, you want a glue that you can trust. Because a glue that doesn't work can ruin any project in a hurry. Fortunately, Tightbond has the glue you need to get the job done with confidence. From interior glues with strong initial tack and short clamp times, to exterior glues with exceptional strength and water resistance, look to Tightbond, the right glue for your next project. For more information, visit tightbond.com. T I T E B O N D dot com. Fine Woodworking is bringing our best instructors right to your home with our shop class webinars. With these virtual workshops, you can watch, listen, ask questions, and enjoy the chats and connections with other woodworkers and our experts. To find out more, go to finewoodworking.com slash shop class. Okay, so uh, Bob Van Dyke and Mike Michelli have officially taken over the podcast here. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need you. <laughs> okay, um, I want to throw a stupid question at you guys because we usually do a, um, you know, a favorite yeah. something of all time for the week. So well, there's one left, Mike, if we got that. I know, we're going right, to get okay. there. Actually, we, gotta, we came up with some more questions too. Um, here it is. If you could... <laughs> Only use one finish for the rest of your finishing career. This is tough for you because you know about a lot more finishes than I do. I do. Um, what is your going to be your one go-to finish if you were stuck using one thing? Wow. Um, huh. Boy, uh, that's tough. I would say um, nitrocellulose lacquer, straight lacquer. Okay. Um, there is, to date, Nothing that replaces it in all of its ability to do all the things it does. I would dearly hate to give up shellac. I would dearly hate to give up all the modern finishes. I'd hate to give up all the varnishes. But the most versatile, uh, incredibly adaptable product is old-fashioned lacquer. There's nothing that replaces it yet. 
uh, in any of the waterborns yeah. or anything else. So Which that would be my it was, choice. It was used so extensive. I mean, for basically industry. most of the 20th century, uh, the go-to finish for everything furniture was lacquer. And there's good reasons. Um, so that would be the one that would be the hardest to give up, even though it'd be really hard to give up <laughs> shellac. Cool. Bob, what about you? You don't uh, really spray lacquer. You don't have a the, lot yeah, of experience I mean, with that. Yeah, I mean, that's, for me, that's not a, um, you know, good question because I don't know enough. I mean, I know what I've used the most. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I used to, I used to think that I was a purist because I'd only be using oil finishes. And when I first began, oh, I'm a purist. Um, and it wasn't until much later that I realized that I was actually just full of it. And the only reason <laughs> I was using the oil finish was because it was what I could do. Yes. Um, slab, Which is Terry a Masashi. really good consideration. Slather. Yeah. Yes. Sla Terry used to go, yeah, there's Bob slathering on oil, <laughs> you know, and it was because that's what I knew how to do. And yeah, you can get it. You can get an acceptable, an acceptable thing with very little skill and it works. Uh -huh. um, you know, you get more skill um, and you start to use, you know, the wiping varnishes or right. the shellac. Um, I don't have spray capability here. Otherwise I would use, uh, right. I would be shooting lacquer. Um, you know, I kid around with my students and go, yeah, three coats of high gloss black Krylon spray paint. <laughs> so that You're done. Be, that has to be uh -huh. your answer since you say that all the time. <laughs> that's it. Krylon, that's Bob's go-to. <laughs> yep. And the high gloss black. Oh, it's yeah. very classy. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So you and I are, are sort of in the same boat where we're woodworkers who finish out of need and usually under duress. Right, right. So <laughs> um, for me, I would say like a wiping varnish just because it's super versatile. You can wipe it on, wipe it off and make it look like an in-the-wood oil finish. Mm -hmm. Or because it actually is a drying film, you could build it up, which is what you use, to a pretty high sheen finish or everything in between. It is like a wiping varnish is incredibly versatile Yeah, because you can put it on where, you know, you have the people, oh, I didn't want any, I, I want like no finish. I don't want it to look like it has finish on it. So, I mean, you, you can put it on, you know, just wiping it on, wiping it off. There's barely any finish there. The downside is that there's not a lot of protection there. Right. Um, doing it that way, or you can treat it like a, like a traditional varnish. And build and, it up and get some decent protection out of yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, I think of it as how many layers of saran wrap were you going to put on? <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, put it. but the problem is it looks like saran wrap. So if you are brushing on, and it's a varnish, I mean, it, it is a varnish, um, you know, if you you rubbing it out is kind of necessary, yeah. You know. Well, the other issue for me, and the reason I picked lacquer, is because of the repairability. Yeah. Uh, the hard thing about the varnishes is that when you recoat, if you have an issue like the fella before with a you know mark in the middle of a table, yeah, very oh. difficult to repair a varnish without having to recoat the entire surface. Okay. Whereas lacquer will, the, the term used in the trades is melt in. The new, the new lacquer will melt into the old lacquer and form a continuous film. It will film. partially dissolve it. Right. Okay. Same with shellac. Okay. Those yeah. two evaporative type finishes are the only ones that remelt each it to themselves. And the, the repairability of lacquer is really the reason why it was the standard for so many years. Yeah. Because as you're manufacturing a piece, as we know, I just helped Bob a little while ago with a piece. And just in the process of getting it put together or moving it around the shop or getting it delivered and there's a scuff or a scratch, you go, oh, my God, now what do I do? Right. And lacquer is so forgiving in that regard. Also, its ability to work in different conditions. You can adjust the, the lacquer thinner to your atmospheric conditions, whether temperature and humidity, wow. and you can do a lot more uh, uh, adjustment with it because your chemistry is adjustable with your solvent. Whereas in your varnish, you just have your mineral spirits or naphtha. Yeah, wow. very cool. So, um, you know, just a different thing. And as I say, don't, don't let me, let me get this on record. I don't really ever want to give up shellac. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So okay. while we're still sort of on the science of things, this is a really good transition into a, a real actual um, 
listener question. Um, Hi guys, I've been listening to some old episodes in episode 59, which I have no recollection of whatsoever. Question was asked about uh, comparing Danish oil and wiping varnish. Uh, one of the statements mentioned real varnish. I was wondering what real varnish means. Um, and he enjoys the program immensely. So, um, yeah. So what is the difference between something branded Danish oil versus a wiping varnish? Well, how much time do we have? Yeah, <laughs> really. I'll, I'll try to do this, um, a, a shorter version of what I do in my class. Uh, the basic basis of most of the finishes that, that you guys are talking about, the oil finishes, is linseed oil. Linseed comes from the flax plant, which is what linen uh, fabric is made from. And the little flax seeds, which are edible, it's a health food item. If you squish a whole bunch of flax seeds you make flax or linseed oil. Cool. That's a natural oil. It's a it's a plant product, and it will uh, eventually dry on its own. If you encourage it by leaving it out in the sun or by boiling it, it'll dry a little faster. So it's a drying oil, but it's oil. So it absorbs into the wood to a certain extent, and it does not form a rigid, firm film. It's an oil. Think of olive oil, walnut oil, peanut oil. It's a natural oil. What happened a, a million years ago... Which doesn't have the resin. Right. right. So people who used oil finishes, um, which were very successful, shellac came from the Far East, from uh, mostly from India, and it came back over the trade routes. And shellac also is a natural product. It's a bug uh, excrement, if you will. And it's solid at room temperature. So shellac flakes, if you, as you've seen, it looks like corn flakes. You know, uh, they're solid at room temperature, and you dissolve them with a solvent, which is plain old alcohol. And the term for that in the finishing books is a spirit varnish, the spirit being alcohol and the resin being the natural bug stuff. Oh, cool. Okay. But the bug stuff forms a film. So you take this stuff at, at room temperature as a flake, you melt it in some alcohol, you cast it out with a brush or a pad, and it dries and forms a film, and that film is hard. So that's a spirit varnish. I mean, as the solvent evaporates as out. As the alcohol evaporates, it leaves the shellac film behind, and you have, as Bob says, so many layers of saran wrap. Cool. The oil, when it, when it, when it, it dries in, in a different way, there's, um, and it doesn't leave a film. So if I can use a term, if you fortify the linseed oil with something that's a resin, you can make a varnish. And the resins that were available at the time in the Middle Ages or the Renaissance were natural products. So a resin would be pine sap. Uh, and if you take uh, f fresh pine sap, you can make rosin or colophony. And you melt that into your varnish with heat. So you're breaking the, the, the heat of the cooking of it, breaks down the, the resin. And now you fortified that oil so it not only penetrates into the wood, but it also leaves a film. So you're making a resin varnish. And then some really smart person found these fossilized pieces of uh, tree sap uh, in various parts of the world, particularly in uh, New Zealand and Australia, that were from ancient big pine trees like our big redwoods. And the famous one is copal, and it looks like a little... Um, rock candy rock or like a piece of amber that, you know, like the, when we were kids, the bug in an amber yeah. for the fossil. So there's this fossilized rock of tree sap. If you smash it up in a mortar and pestle, it makes dust. If you cook your linseed oil to a high temperature and you melt in some of this resin, you make varnish. And if you add in some other stuff, like the spaghetti sauce, you can make the varnish more flexible, like a spar varnish where you'd put some castor oil in so it's more, you know, it doesn't dry as quickly. Or you put in some other additives and you can make whatever you're going to make. And for the last four or 500 years, people have been experimenting with different resins in linseed oil to make various formulations that got a special name. McCloskey's spar varnish is a particular resin in a particular concoction of linseed oil. And what happens when you do that is it gets gummy and sticky and you need something to make it brush out or flow out. And the original solvent was turpentine. That's what was available. Now we have synthetics. We have the chemicals like mineral spirits or I greatly prefer naphtha. Um, so you've got three components. You've got the oil, you've got the resin, and you've got some kind of a solvent. And you put that together and you make your product. So to answer the question that was asked here, Dan there's no such thing as Danish oil. 
If you go to, to, uh, to Denmark and ask them, they don't know what this is. There is no such thing. It's a trade name. Danish oil is basically skinny varnish. It's linseed oil with a resin and some solvent. And in that case of most like Watco, there's a whole lot of solvent. So it's, a, it's relatively low resin content, high linseed oil content, and lots and lots of uh, thinner or solvent. And it's a skinny varnish. It leaves a thin film. And a real varnish, a true varnish, like a violin varnish or somebody else's varnish, is just another different manufacturer formulation. Maybe it's got two or three different resins. Maybe it's got Copal, Damar, or nowadays some, some artificial resins. And so if I can just, phenolic or polyurethane. Well, the, the, you, you're, when you, for those of us of a certain age, if you remember your grandmother's telephone, those big, heavy black telephones or the old bowling balls, that's a phenolic resin. That's a man-made petroleum-based chemical that is at room temperature, a very, very hard, what we would now call a plastic. So if you take that and smash it up into dust and you cook the linseed oil at a high enough temperature, the, the heat will break down some of that resin and it will blend into the oil and you can make a pretty hard film. So you've got alkyd varnish, you've got urethane varnish. If you use several different urethanes, you can make a polyurethane. Cool. So you're fortifying the basic old-fashioned linseed oil with some resin to make a varnish. And if you're trying to do that in a, in a waterborne system, you got a whole bunch of other different technology. But for, the, for most cases, um, the, the stuff that Bob's using, the water locks or the Watco or tried and true, those are still linseed oil. There's certain kind of resin. They don't tell you what it is, whether it's single or blend. And it's, usually it's a relatively inexpensive solvent like mineral spirits, which is a blend. So you don't really, they don't tell you what's in the can. But it's really all the same basic chemistry. Uh, there's no real difference between wiping varnish and Danish oil. It's the same stuff. Just a higher percentage of resin, right. basically. Right. It always amazes me that, you know, you think about the origin of these things. And, you know, you think about shellac, which is bug excre excrement on it a is. tree. It is. It's and not some like, guy walking along. It's not excrement. Well, it's Well, it's, it's, as my friend Don Williams would say, it's exudate. It's, I like that word, Mike. It's, it's, so the bug, bug spit. They it's lay spit. eggs on a branch. And it's a cocoon thing. It's a spit. And they secrete. Yeah. This stuff to protect the eggs. Right. It's not poop, Bob. It's okay. Not, yes. No, I didn't know that. It's not okay. poop. Right. Okay. Yes. So, but some guy walking along sees Got all sticky this. sticky fingers. He sees all this stuff up on a tree. Yep. And he's looking at it going, you know, that would look killer on a Queen Anne high boy. You know? Uh -huh. <laughs> it just amazes me. Uh-huh. Or, or, the, or the, pine, the pine sap. Yeah. Yeah, let's take... Let's take some of that and melt it down and put it on a piece of furniture. Well, you know, let's imagine, distill some of that and make turpentine. Yeah. I imagine someone collecting branches from this tree with this on it. They throw it in the campfire. Oh, it burned really good. And oh, all yeah. this goopy stuff came out. Yeah. So it's okay. amazing. <laughs> we were, I don't know. I'm guessing we're getting a little long in the tooth here. However, Bob ran into a shop because we're actually recording out back behind a Connecticut school. Connecticut Valley School of Woodworking, and Bob ran in and grabbed a whole bunch of stuff because he thought we were going to talk about it, and I feel bad for not. So, Bob, <laughs> why did you bring all these squares and such out? Because you usually ask, what's your favorite tool <laughs> yes. of all time? And then with the caveat, this week. So, yeah. Bob, what's your favorite tool of all time for the week? Well, it's a group of tools, <laughs> okay? okay? Um, That's cheating, Bob. He said one. It is a group of tools. Um, and measuring it's tools. Way here. <laughs> measuring tools have always fascinated me, um, and especially measuring tools made by Starrett. Um, you know, so the six-inch scale, uh, the Starrett six-inch scale, like, is in my back pocket all the time, ripping a hole in my back pocket of every pair of jeans I own, um, you know, and I'd be lost without it. But then you go, you know, like the same thing. You got a 24-inch Starrett scale. That's amazing how versatile and useful it is. And then you've got the 12-inch Starrett square that has a scale, okay? And so you use this constantly. 
And then this little baby one here, which is kind of, I don't use that very often, but you know, I use it more for sharpening if I'm checking uh, how square a, a, an edge is. Um, and then you got this depth gauge here, um, this Starrett depth gauge, which, you know, all of this stuff is completely available. Um, you know, I'm starting showing my age because I'm talking about <laughs> flea markets. That's what I think of. Um, and then, but, you know, eBay or whatever. And these depth gauges here are amazingly good, um, you know, for checking the depth of something, obviously. Uh, but it's also a little square, you know. I mean, being Starrett, it's going to be perfectly square, the, the plunge part of it. Uh, so I've used this for a square frequently, you oh, cool. know. You see people going on about these little... Um, special dovetail squares yeah. that, uh, you know, I would never use that for that. I use a scale to check if, if my, um, dovetails are straight, but the same idea, if I want a little, little square that it will fit into something, well, this depth gauge fits perfectly and I can get it for 12 bucks online, you know, stare it. It's amazing. Cool. Well, having just been to a flea market last week in Maine, uh, I can tell you that there's an awful lot of folks of our parents' generation and our generation that were in the machinist trade yeah. that are no longer working. And many of these little tiny tools, which were used by machinists, you can buy super high quality LS Starrett stamp tools for really great prices because people don't do machine work. Right. Yeah. But they're great for woodworking. They certainly are. They, they are amazing. Better than we deserve. Well. <laughs> and the today's trivia, my, my understanding is that, uh, what was the name? Leonard Starrett? Mm -hmm. Was that it? Um, was the guy who um, patented the original um, sliding, sliding combination wow. square like mm -hmm. this. Very cool. He would turn over in his grave if he saw what was being sold as a combination square. <laughs> this but, episode not brought to you by Starrett, but probably <laughs> should have been. <laughs> so. It's an amazing, you know, this stuff is amazing, cool. you know. Um, so. Probably on, on that note, we should start to wrap this up. I want to thank Bob for hosting us here and Mike for coming down. You single-handedly, because Bob and I have been on lots of podcasts before, but you single-handedly made this the very best podcast episode oh, you're, we've ever you're had. You're very kind. And I realize it comes down to actually having someone on who knows what they're talking about. <laughs> that's so, something different. <laughs> yes, it is. So, so that's all for this episode of Shop Talk Live. If you have any questions you'd like us to answer on the show, send them in to shoptalk at taunton.com. If you're watching on YouTube, please check the thumbs up button. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks for listening. Hey, do you guys want to do a bit? Uh, favorite tool of all time, favorite technique. Oh, you mean like Burns and Allen? Yeah. <laughs> or Robin, yeah. Robin Costello? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do a shtick, Bob. Right, it's not poop, Bob. It's not poop. Fine Woodworking Magazine has a long history of bringing inspiring content to our readers. You can subscribe by going to finewoodworking.com slash sub.